Good morning. It's good to be back with you this morning. I have to brag on my family a little bit. They all got dressed and got out to the vehicle. We left on time to get here and had a good drive. I kept it uh, at 55 right there on the speed limit with the cruise control, obeying the laws of God and man. We're making wonderful time to get here about a good five minutes early before opening assembly. And the way I usually get here coming from Union is to turn just past the funeral home uh, coming down where the commercial driver's license station is. I think on uh, Coliseum is the name of the road. And I'm I'm coming down that road and I turn a corner or, or a curve, I should say. And there in the middle of the road is a blue porta potty with a slow-moving vehicle sign on the back. It's perched up on top of a wagon being pulled by a donkey. Now, one of the verses on our Sunday school lesson this morning, if you were in here, was there's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything to make you think this is new? (laughs) Yes, this is new. This is not something I've ever encountered before. But uh, we, uh, we, we, we got past him, and there is a sea of horses and donkeys and mules, I guess, pulling uh, trailers. And uh, it, my daughter timed us driving past them. It took us almost five minutes to get past them. So we got here just in time for opening assembly. And uh, I, we, we sat down, and uh, it, was, it was on the light. And uh, the Lord said, see, it's okay. You're here. You're on target you know that what you're preaching is exactly what needs to be preached because I'm preaching on light this morning. Um, and it's, it's always very, very sweet when God uh, communicates uh, so beautifully through people who have not communicated with each other. I love when he does that during the song service. The angels beckon me, the choir just sang a few minutes ago. Savior like a shepherd lead us. He leads us through his light. Uh, the Sunday school lesson uh, really uh, pointed toward what I'm, uh, Lord willing, as far as I know, what I'm going to be preaching tonight. Uh, but uh, if, if, you, if you don't have a habit of making it for opening assembly and uh, Sunday school and the, and the music service, uh, Sunday school and um, uh, preaching on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, it's been my... Uh, observation over 25 years in the ministry that God takes one portion of a service and he leads in making them all work together. Even when the pastor and the music director don't communicate. Well, the, the, I've, I've seen it where uh, the music director talks with the pastor. What are you preaching? Well, okay, th- then this is what I need to pick. I don't, like, I don't like when that happens. I like when God is able to, to flow everything together. And I said all that to say this. If you're not in the habit of, of being here uh, when the doors are open, it, it just seems to me that if, if God is that purposeful, in making his message flow and even grow and be based upon what came before to flow from one into the other. If you're not here for part of it, then you're missing out on something that he wants for you. Now, I realize people have jobs and things of that nature. I'm not talking about that. But I like what the old preacher said at one point in time. Unless you're sick or dead or providentially hindered, you need to be in the house of God when the doors are open. Amen. Well, today we're talking about uh, the first command. That's the title of the message. Uh, it, it is a time of firsts. Everything in our life really uh, can be looked at as a time of firsts, even though there is nothing new under the sun. Um, but uh, uh, we're, we're going to talk today about the first command. Now, when I talk about the first command... I'm not talking about the first of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. No, it's, it's, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm, I'm also not talking about Matthew 22, verses 36 through 38, which is the first and great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. 
that, that definitely flows into and, and uh, is, is part of it as the Word of God bears witness with itself. No, talking about the first command, it's not the first of the Ten Commandments. It's not the first and great commandment. And it's not even the first command that Jesus preached. Matthew 4.17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not that either. The first command is found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And Lord willing, through this morning and tonight, uh, we're going to talk about how the first of the Ten Commandments and the first and great commandment and that first command that Jesus preached all fit together, part and parcel, with His very first command in creation in the book of Genesis. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And we pray together. Father, thank you for letting us be here today. I thank you for your word that's been preserved through all these ages by the blood of prophets and priests and kings. I pray, God, that as it goes out from this pulpit this morning, I pray, God, that it will do so with boldness, with you as the preacher in my stead. I pray, God, that you'd hide me now behind your cross, having removed me from out from behind this pulpit. I pray, God, that you'd be the great preacher. And as your word goes out in boldness and love and tender compassion and in truth, that, Father, it won't return void without having accomplished that perfect work for which you intend it. We thank you, Father, for that promise in Scripture, and we thank you, Father, that you uh, caused that to be seen and uh, easily uh, beheld. Uh, and uh, even now today, Father, I pray that if there is one here who has never come to know the forgiveness of sin, if they've never come to be saved, I pray, God, that you'd get them to the point where they're lost and can be saved this morning, and let there be one who is born again even today. We praise you, Father. We adore you. And we seek to have you honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. The first command, let there be light. And of course, the result was that there was light, and we saw that it was good. He saw that it was good, and we need to be in agreement with God. Uh, he saw that it was good, and it is good, and he hasn't changed his mind on how good the light is. He still sees light as good. He still sees darkness as not, uh, and they are divided. Um, th there is one who echoes what God said about light, and this is in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 7. We're in the book of Ecclesiastes in Sunday school. And here we are again, this is a few chapters later, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Uh, King Solomon is writing about the light, and he says this in verse 7 of Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Truly, the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. Now he's in complete agreement with God about the light. Now, God created light well before He created the sun. One of these days, uh, when all uh, that we know is done away with, the book of Revelation says that in glory, there's no need for the sun, because Jesus is the light of the city. Now, in, uh, in, on the first day, God said, let there be light. It wasn't until days after that that He created the sun. Now, they're talking about a physical light. And if physical light is sweet, how much sweeter the spiritual light. And, and really, by talking about spiritual light, I'm talking about mental light. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But uh, the things that we are intended to behold under physical light, uh, if, if, you've, if you remember your science, maybe you're a science teacher, you got Roy G. Biv as the mental tool that they give you to remember the seven colors in the color spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. There are things that we are meant to see by 
God's natural lighting. Of course, man has had the ability to recreate an artificial light that doesn't allow you to see uh, everything is exactly as it is. But when God gave us light, it was for us to be able to see things in this physical world that he has created uh, according to his design. But what about spiritual light? Well, if physical light was given to us so we can see things physically, then spiritual light is for us to behold spiritual things, the things that need to be seen by the light of the Word of God. And I called it a mental light. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them, that believe not, lest the glorious light of the gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Uh, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And in beholding things by this spiritual sweet light, we need to have a change of attitude regarding that which we are able to see. Each of us is a sinner, born in sin, conceived in sin. By nature and by choice and by habit, we live as sinful people, born as the enemy of God. And when God, by His grace and His mercy, allows us to see ourselves before Him as what we are, He's inviting us to see things by His grace. True light. We see things by a false light, but he wants us to see things by this beautiful gospel light. In Psalm 96, 9, it says that we need to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Looking at things by anything other than that sweet gospel light, we're not going to see holiness as beautiful. Our nature loves the darkness rather than the light. We want our deeds to be covered by darkness. We don't see holiness. We don't see separation from the world as beautiful. That's why in this world we have tribulation. Jesus uh, pointed that out to us and, and said, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He wants us to see that He is holy. And the things pertaining to Him and related to Him are holy called out and separate. It's, it's not a, a, a matter of uh, trying to str struggle and strain to live uh, a, a, a better life. No, it's to honor and glorify Him and to live by what's going to uh, extol His light and lift it up, which is what we as the people of God need to do. We are not children of darkness. We're children of light. We are not children of the night. We're children of the day. He wants us to see that He desires a love relationship with us in spite of ourselves, in spite of our sin, in spite of the habit that we so desperately seem to want to have in walking in darkness. I pastored in Wyoming for a while. And while we were in Wyoming, oh, the cold. We, we had a cold snap come through here a little bit ago, but I'm, I'm talking cold. I'm talking Jeffrey City, Wyoming, a little ghost town, used to be a uranium mine town. The uranium market dried up with Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. And when that happened in the early 80s, everybody got up and left. Population of 35 people while we were there. 100 people, 100, uh, you know, in the little bit of uh, highway surrounding the community. It had about 100 people that... Uh, that we could call our church field. And Jeffrey City is located right in line with a mountain pass, uh, or, or I should say a, a little valley where two mountains uh, come together. And if, uh, if you picture blowing out through tightly closed lips, that, that, that's how the wind was concentrated blowing through Jeffrey City. As a matter of fact, uh, when the market dried up and everybody pulled out of town, most of them left their empty concrete basements just wide open to 
the air. And whenever that wind would blow through, it sounded like a, a lady calling out in distress. As a matter of when, when I f- first moved there, I was, I was fooled by it on my walk to the mailbox one day. I thought I heard a lady just, oh, that's, a, that's, that's what it sounded like. Um, but, uh, and, and it was cold. The wind was blowing. Uh, talking about the wind, uh, the, the, the pastor who had been there before we moved there, uh, they lived in a mobile home out behind the church building. And just between that mobile home and the back door of the church, the pastor was bringing in some pizzas for a youth event. And in that short space, the wind blew through, blew through so hard that it blew the toppings off of the pizza before he could get it into the back door of the church. How fun that was to eat, I, I don't know. They didn't elaborate on that. But it wasn't just a, a, a hard wind. It was a cold wind. And we heated the church with a wood-burning stove. Uh, and I'd, I'd go in from Sunday to Sunday and, uh, and with, with enough time to, to get the wood going and and uh, so the, the heat from the stove would be able to heat the sanctuary. One, I don't know how cold, it was, it was less than 10 or 12 degrees. And I was uh, trying to get the wood going. And finally, I, I got it to catch up, and it began to blaze. And I sat there just warming my hands in the middle of the sanctuary. Um, and I heard this racket at the front door. We had this cat named Cheesecake. The cat, I don't know, hated my guts. I don't know of a nicer way to put it than that. This cat did not like me. As a matter of fact, I had a, an old work truck that was, was consistently without air in one of its tires. And I can just picture that little cat with its claw just psh, letting the air out of my tire. This, this cat did not like me at all. But I, I opened the front door of the church and if, if you've seen those Garfield plush toys with the suction cups that people used to, back in the 80s, uh, have hanging on the, the window on, on the side of their car, this cat, with its claws, was stuck to the front door of the church. And then when it looked up and saw me and jumped off the front door and ran halfway through, or halfway down the, the set of steps there, and I got down on my knee, and I did the, the standard cat call. Kitty, 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 kitty. I don't know who came up with that as a good way to call a cat. But I tried it. The cat wasn't going to have any part of that. And uh, I said, come here, cheesecake. Come here, kitty. Come here. Came up a few more steps and just would not come to me no matter what I did. And uh, another gust of cold wind blew through, and I would have liked to have thought that the cat would have come on up to me for just a little bit of shelter. But what it did was it just hunkered down and stuck its head up under one of the steps and would not come to, would not come to me. And I thought, well, you cat, I wanted to love you to myself. I wanted to get you and have you come to me and hold you in my arms just in front of this warm fire for just a moment, out of the wind, out of the cold, sheltered from everything that was outside, but you wouldn't come to me. And my immediate thought after I had closed the door and sat down in front of that fire was, that's what people do to God constantly, consistently. Here we are being buffeted in the storm of sin, and yet... Because of something we'll have to give up, because of this reason, that reason, God is constantly bidding us, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and we won't come to him. In Matthew 23, 37, Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them, which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Isn't it good to be out of the storm? 
Those of you who are here this morning who have been saved, you've been forgiven of your sin, isn't it good to be out from the storm? Let the storms rage high, the dark clouds rise. They don't worry me, for I'm sheltered safe within the arms of God. Oh, how wonderful. And it, it's uh, you know, thinking about uh, music that glorifies God. And it's, you know, to, to, have a, to have a good, uplifting music service where the old hymns of Zion are sung. It's, it's always so grand to, to sing something like, uh, He took my sins and my sorrows, He made them His very own. But what we need to do is not just have something that's going to put a pep in our step and cause us to face the day. What we need to do is remember what the storm was like what those winds of sin howling around us were like and what he has redeemed us from, to actually say, he took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary. He suffered and died alone. And we need to allow our hearts to just weep with gladness and thanksgiving and adoration over that. Yes, it's, it's wonderful, it's grand to, uh, to have something to, uh, to charge into this, uh, uh, into this life with. Uh, onward, Christian soldiers, uh, marching as to war. So this world doesn't look at people who call themselves Christians and think, well, life's good, brother. Praise God, life's good. Huh, you ever know somebody like that? <laughs> I'm guilty of that sometimes. How you doing, brother Brent? Life's good. Everything's grand. Life's good. Do you know what I'd be were it not for the grace and mercy? Overflowing from the love of God through Jesus Christ. Praise God. Let's, let's let this world see that uh, there is something glorious. There's an old song that says, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Vast, unmeasured, boundless, free. Rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of thy love. Leading onward, leading homeward to thy glorious rest above. And uh, that song could be sung to a multitude of different melodies. And one of those is, what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. And that's what God wants with us, that relationship. He wants to call us friend. Even more than wanting to call us friend, Jesus, in dealing with his followers, his apostles, to the point, uh, he, he called them first servants. He said, the servant doesn't know what the master does. And then on the morning that he had arisen from uh, the, the tomb, the borrowed tomb, he said, go and tell my brothers. He went from calling us servants to friends and from friends to brothers. He wants that brother-sister relationship. At the, at the same time that he wants us to look at him as master and savior and Lord. And this is the message that he wants shown through us. Each and every truly born-again child of God who has experienced the forgiveness of sin, who has come to know Him as Savior, and who knows us. The Bible says that there are going to be many disappointed in that day when He says, uh, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. The question is, does He know us? But uh, He wants that relationship with us in part so that the love that he has for this world can be shed abroad through our hearts. So if we know him, if we've come to know him through repentance and faith, then we are an evangelist. And if we are not evangelizing, if we are not going out there and telling people about Jesus, what he's done for us, what he wants to do for them, then we're not doing what it is we're supposed to be doing. Now, for many, many years, most of my ministry, I was a Southern Baptist. And uh, while we were in Wyoming, um, God began to really deal with me about why that was not a good fit. 
Um, I was on the executive committee of the Wyoming Southern Baptist Convention, and I went to their evangelism conference. And those of you who are listening to this on the recording are not going to see my air quotes, evangelism conference. I use the air quotes because I'm taking it lightly to call it an evangelism conference. There was a preacher, pastor, from Arkansas. They flew him in because his church was apparently a very quickly growing church. And may I just interject this here? Just because you have a quickly growing church does not necessarily mean you have a God-honoring church. The devil will take and uh, bless just about anything that is a really good counterfeit of the real thing. Uh, That's not to say that if the church is really doing well, that God is not a part of that. But this, uh, this individual stood up before us, and he told us that he had, at first, gotten some resistance from the people in the church when those uh, young people who had chosen to have their hair pink and uh, the various facial piercings and, and what have you, they came in, which is a, a very good part. Uh, they... Uh, people, no matter what they look like, no matter what they've done to their physical bodies, they need to be born again. But when the people in the church, in the leadership of the church, begin to play their particular style of music within the church, when those church leadership uh, individuals who are trying to win the people out in the world over begin themselves to dye their own hair pink, yeah, I I think there's something not entirely right about that. And here's the reason. The reason expressed as to why all those things were done was that, are you ready for this? We have got to confirm their lifestyle. Affirm, I think they said. We've got to affirm their lifestyle. Really? Really? Because that's not what I find in here. We're talking about the difference between light and darkness. At what point must you affirm the darkness to call people out of it to the light? No, it doesn't work that way. There's no need to have it work that way. When you put up a bright light, the moths are going to come to it. When you put up a bright light, those that are out in the darkness are going to see that light. They're going to see it as something vastly different from what they're in. And they're going to recognize that they need to come to that. There's an old song that says, Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Here's what we have done. Not so much in changing the words to that song uh, on a piece of paper, but in our living, according to what the Bible says, about extolling the light. We've said, come to the light, I've dimmed it for thee. Now that bright light's no longer garish for thee. Huh? We've taken a rheostat, a a dimmer switch, and we've dimmed it. We've dimmed the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, trying to get people to come in. Now, I'm not against young people having fun. I'm not against older people having fun. I think the church of God ought to be a place where we, yes, we can have fun together. Amen. I'm all for it. But let's not make it the world's fun. The things that entertain this world don't need to be entertaining to us. We walk a completely different path now. We walk a path of holiness and sanctification. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. We, uh, we've got to come before him and not only extol the light for what it is, but we've got to end 
the walk in darkness and show those out there that there is an end to a walk of darkness. You know, having gone through seminary and talked with uh, uh, my, my fellow students who, who were pastors and, and in some cases church planters, well, we're going to have a Baptist church, but we're not going to include the word Baptist in the name of the church. Because people won't come if the word Baptist is in the name of the church. So you're going to trick them into coming to God. Because that's the exact same thing that we're doing by making our church look like, a, look like the world. We're giving them the message, hey, church, I mean, uh, hey, those in the world, we're just like you. Come on, we're just like you. No, we're not. We have been changed. We have been bought with the most precious price, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins have been atoned for. No, I'm not like the people in the world anymore. No. There's got to be a, a, a very clear demarcation that we have had an end put to our walk in darkness. Throughout the Bible, darkness and night are symbolic of sin. Night, in, in John 9, 4, Jesus said that the night time is a time when the work of the Father cannot be carried out. We must do our work in the day. God is our Father of lights. He's our just and righteous Creator. He despises sin. And it's His will that we respond to His drawing us and finding fellowship with Him. God hates sin for two primary reasons that I've been able to find in Scripture. Number one, it's the exact opposite of who He is. Sin is the exact opposite of who He is. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And I'm very quickly going to go through a, a list of verses here. God is righteous. In Ezra 9.15 it says, O Lord God of Israel, Thou art righteous. Psalm 7.9, O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God trieth the hearts and reins. Psalm 116.5, Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. 2 Timothy 4.8, There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. So God is righteous, and uh, being found within His Son, we are righteous. 2 Corinthians 6, 14-18, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty." Now, unrighteousness, living outside of a righteous standing and position with God, is the fact of the matter with anyone who has sinned, which is all of us. Sin is missing the mark. I said at the very beginning of the message, talking about the first of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are the perfect standard against which each of us is going to be judged. It's the perfect law of God. It's a standard of righteousness. And if we have sinned in but one point, James chapter 2, verse 10, if someone is able to keep the whole law, yet offends in one point, he is guilty of all. So uh, if, turn with me just very quickly. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6. Say, preacher, you don't understand. I am not that bad of a person. 
I'm, I'm a good person. You know, Jesus even said, why call ye me good? There's only one good, and that's God. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Now, Brother Mike was talking in Sunday school this morning about how when we've done something wrong, sometimes when we're about to do something wrong, we try to find an excuse for it. But you don't understand it. I had this reason for doing it. I'm a, I'm a good person. No, not according to the Word of God, because each of us uh, is a, a sinner. We've each broken the law. We've, we've uh, missed the mark. And our having missed the mark, according to Isaiah 59, 2, uh, our iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you, that He will not hear. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, we could start with uh, just going through the Ten Commandments. Is there anyone here who has ever stolen anything? Well, I'm guilty. What does the Bible say? Uh, that person who has stolen is a thief. Uh, we uh, can see in 1 Corinthians 6.10, which lists uh, quite a few uh, uh, sins, thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. And as a matter of fact, let's just go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 6.10. What about having borne false witness against our neighbor? Have, have, you ever, have you ever told a lie? Which one of us has not ever told a lie? As we continue on to 1 Corinthians 6.10. Well, anybody who tells a lie is called a liar. According to Revelation 21.8, all liars will have their part in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But in 1 Corinthians, let's see, we will uh, begin reading in verse 9. First, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, uh, these are just as a side note. I don't want to say anything before uh, tender ears, younger ears, but uh, with, uh, with what has now been approved by our nation's uh, so-called highest court in the land and those who say, well, the Bible never says anything against gay marriage, Hello. Um, uh, when, if you were to take a look and very carefully study that verse where it's talking about the effeminate, that's talking about a man who wants to play the role of the woman. And uh, the abusers of themselves with mankind, that's the, the fella who wants to uh, play the role of the man with the fella who wants to play the role of the girl. Okay, It doesn't get any more clear than that. You can take a look and that, that's case closed right there. It's against the Word of God. It's against the will of God. It's against the design of God. It's against God in any way, shape, or form. It's sin. It's wickedness. Uh, it's unnatural. And uh, so, preacher, what about, the, what about the gay Christian? Well, there ain't no such critter, okay? I've made people mad saying it before. I'll make them mad saying it again. I'll go to glory making people mad for saying it. There ain't no such a critter as a homosexual Christian. Amen. Verse 10, Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. What a dark picture. As the Bible is full of some dark pictures. So that the light can be extolled. Because continue reading in verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed but ye are sanctified. That means you don't do that anymore because you have been forgiven of sin. You live a new life now. You've come out from among them. You're now clean. You're not anymore touching the unclean thing. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Well, thank God there is a good news uh, when the bad news becomes so bad. Well, how are we washed? For God so loved the world. It means He loved the world in this way, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We need to come to repentance in Him. Well, how does that happen? What is repentance? It's a turning away from sin. It's a turning to God. 
and embracing that the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his having risen from the tomb was for me. I've embraced that in repentance and faith. And that repentance comes from God through His Holy Spirit showing us that we are sinners before God, standing as His enemies, in need of being washed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Now, I, uh, I mentioned that God hates sin because it is the polar opposite of who He is. The other reason He hates sin is because of the harm that it has done, the destruction that sin has done to the creation that He loves, you and me. To a certain extent, I suppose, this physical world that He has created, but... But you and me, it's, it's destroyed our fellowship with Him. Well, preacher, doesn't the Bible say that we were created in His image? Yes, yes it does, but we destroyed that by sinning against God. That's why uh, Romans 8.29 says that uh, for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Well, if we're already in the image of God, why do we have to be conformed to the image of God? Because somewhere along the way, there was a breaking away from God. There was a time when we no longer were in the image of God, and that's when we sinned. So consider the wondrous beauty of this, of 2 Corinthians 5.21. We've talked about two primary reasons why God hates sin. The one who hates sin so much became sin for us because of his amazing, dramatic, unmatchable, searchless love for us. He became that which he vehemently hated so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him, so that we who had sinned against him can stand before him and be viewed as righteous, justified, without sin. Oh, just dwell on that. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful showing of how much He loves us. Uh, he did that because He knows there is no other way for us to have that intimate fellowship with Him that He desires. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6, and I'm done in honor of that, that big ball game they're playing tonight. I'm going to say that we've heard the two-minute warning and the ball's wherever the ball needs to be, but we're fixing to run this thing in for a touchdown. I believe God's working on somebody today. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe in accidents. I believe that before I was born, I believe that before time began, God looked down on February 7, 2016, and knew that I was going to be up here preaching. And not just that, but I was going to be preaching this specific, Pacific is an ocean, this specific message. And I believe that he had everybody here who was supposed to be here to hear this. So what is God speaking to you today as we read Isaiah 53, 4 through 6? Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I walk around all my life before having come to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And I've got my iniquity. And I've, it's, it's on me. And uh, uh, the price that I have to pay, if I want fellowship with God, 
If I don't want to suffer eternity separated from Him in hell, if I want to go to heaven, then the cost is on me. And the only way I can do it is to live by the law of God perfectly. But what the law shows us is that none of us is able to do that. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to grace. But according to what the prophet wrote here in chapter 53, in these verses that I've read, the end of verse 6, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. This being Jesus, if you will. My iniquity has been laid on Him. Well, where is it not anymore? It's not on me anymore. My sins are gone. I am now free. I am now forgiven. I am now justified. I have peace before God and I stand in righteousness. Well, God laid my sin, my iniquity, on His Son, Jesus. It pleased the Lord to bruise Him, the Bible says. And Jesus, again, He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, friend, are you here today without a one-on-one intimate love fellowship with God the Father through Jesus Christ? Are you here today having never come to know what it is to be forgiven of sin. That's not what God wants. God is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How is it with you? And for those of us who are here today that know that we know that we know that we know that we know that we're saved, glory to God, are you extolling the light? Are we extolling the light? Are we lifting up the wonderful light of Jesus? Or are we trying to dim it? Is the way that we're living our life with one foot off in the world trying to walk with God at the same time? One foot in the world, one foot with God. You can't walk that way. Don't dim the light by mingling it with the darkness of sin. Lord willing, we're going to be getting more into that tonight. But may we pray together. Father, would you please bless as the uh, instrumentalists come, Brother Mark comes. Father, I pray that you would take this message and apply it to the heart, the life of each one here. Father, I believe that there are those who need to hear it, whether they're born again or not. Uh, We need your light. We need to continually follow and be drawn to your light. For that one who is here, Father, who is caught up in the storm of sin, the storms are raging, the wind is blowing, it's cold, uh, there's no hope for comfort other than in you. And I pray, God, that if there's one here caught in that storm, you'd allow them to see that, that they need to be saved. Father, for those of us that are saved, I pray, God, that you would show us, convict us of what it is that we need to be shown so that, God, our life can be more pleasing to you and that, God, it can be more of a beacon toward those around us who need to be saved and for those saints around us who need to be encouraged to press on. Help us today, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. May we stand together. Brother Mark? 247. 247. Whatever it is that God has shown you, However he's dealt with you, just be obedient. The old song says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The altar is open.